Welcome viewers to this series of lectures on European history, modern European history rather it is 19th century European society that we are precisely talking about and in the last couple of lectures we had run through uh, quite a few uh, details about the society in 19th century Europe ranging from some of the uh, demographic issues, uh, some of the developments in the uh, sector of uh, health and medicine and healing, uh, some discoveries uh, leading to some kind of uh, uh, you can say enhancement of life expectancy and so forth and then the models through which uh, scholars have sought to apprehend these changes happening. Uh, we ran through uh, the concerns uh, expressed by people in 19th century Europe about the transformations that they were going through. The most fundamental of them of course, being the industrial revolution as it spread to greater part of Europe and also couple of uh, revolutions in the form of say French revolution and so forth and uh, march towards uh, uh, nation states, uh, liberal uh, democracies and also the ideas of socialism uh, which uh, emerged out of that sense of a strife that was there between the haves and have nots and theoreticians uh, have used uh, the Marxist uh, exposition uh, about things in uh, 19th century Europe to make a sense, to make a better sense of what's, uh, what was happening around. And uh, when we track that, uh, be it uh, through system model or through a strife model uh, to, to understand as to what kind of changes were happening in 19th century Europe. Uh, coming back to uh, the industrial revolution issue and this we had touched upon in our last lecture and this is uh, from this point that we take it forward. Uh, George Lichtenstein, for, for example, uh, speaks of industrial revolution as a new mode of production and way of life that had come to take birth in an environment. Uh, now, here uh, there is uh, a kind of distinction that Lichtenstein is uh, talking about. He says that it is one thing to understand industrial revolution in terms of technological changes, big machinery, factory production so forth, but when it hit Europe. Now, uh, there could be uh, areas where industrialization is happening in Europe in 19th century where uh, there is no uh, or, or it is not uh, it is not uh, uh, I would say uh, uh, preceded by some kind of an uh, ideological or some kind of a, uh, idea a market idea uh, that had spread in those areas. So, uh, the distinction is between those areas where the market principles as an idea or as an institution had already planted itself. And then if industrialization comes, big industries come, it has a different consequence. Whereas, there were areas in Europe where market ideas or free trade ideas or market principles had not taken roots and suddenly uh, big industries come, industrialization happens. So, that uh, kind of a situation elicits a different kind of response and this is what he is talking about that uh, industrial revolution as a new mode of production and way of life came to take birth in an environment already transformed by the rise of market economy and the slow growth of bourgeois civilization. Wherever this preparatory stage had not been reached, industrial revolution evoked a different response. Therefore, there is a need to fill this gap between historical and sociological perspectives. So, what uh, uh, is meant here is that areas uh, where uh, the idea say whatever had been uh, expounded by say Adam Smith towards the last quarter of uh, the 18th century in terms of free trade, market principles uh, and man as calculating the individualized self and so forth. Uh, if these ideas had taken roots, uh, if uh, economics uh, or economic principles had taken roots, if economics uh, is trying to come on its own uh, by uh, getting out of the umbrella of customary practices under which so far economic activities were transacted. So, in those areas where these ideas had already pervaded and then 
uh, or uh, this is what is referred to as preparatory stage. So, if this preparatory stage had been reached and then industrialization comes, it is a different story whereas, if it suddenly comes then it, uh, it uh, elicits a different kind of uh, response and this is what is sociological insight to uh, spread of uh, industrial revolution across regions in Europe. Now, coming back to this traditionally economic decisions were subordinate to things that were customary and social, but philosophical concepts underlying the new science of economics was itself a response to uh, uh, the market centered society. So, uh, we, we have to understand this that uh, uh, whatever we might say about uh, several stages of capitalism say. Uh, the trade capitalism or merchant capitalism and then industrial capitalism and subsequently uh, in Europe uh, in the later half of uh, 19th century we have finance capitalism. So, even uh, as late as up to industrial capitalism uh, say uh, towards the beginning of the uh, 19th century as late as up to the beginning of 19th century economic activity or economics was understood as part of uh, uh, the the custom, the customary practices, the uh, social umbrella within which uh, these activities had to happen. So, it had still not come out of the womb of society and acquire an autonomous mechanized character of its own. So, uh, and we shall see uh, in the uh, later part of today's lecture uh, how different theorists have spoken about and this is important for us to understand that this, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, calculus or this uh, uh, completely uh, rationalized or uh, dehumanized so to say uh, kind of principles on which market uh, functions purely on the basis of profit and loss and all kinds of things and there is no human element to it, there is no sensibilities, there are no sentiments attached to it. So, those things uh, were yet to happen and uh, this kind of market centered society took time to emerge and that is that is the point that we need to be, uh, be mindful of. Uh, therefore, conservative traditionalism, be it conservative traditionalism, be it liberal individualism and socialist collectivism, uh, the way they stood, the way they stand for different forms of social organization. So, here we are talking of uh, different kinds of uh, socio-political responses that were generated by this transformation uh, as a result of uh, market centered society and industrialization that is happening in Europe. So, there are communities, there are people who are arguing for uh, traditional way of life, customary way of life, they are, they are not at all uh, welcoming uh, so far as uh, their approach to the transformation is concerned and they say that well the older norms are good at least they provided solidity uh, to society. and. Uh, the social order is very much in place, uh, but uh, this kind of a uh, situation is all leading to tumult and turbulence and so uh, conservative traditionalism celebrates that uh, pre-industrial uh, setup and uh, the rhythm of life, the slow rhythm of life. Liberal individualism on the other hand is, uh, is, is, the, uh, is the social constituency on the shoulders of which. Uh, these ideas uh, actually uh, come and spread to different parts of Europe. It, it is, it is uh, on this premise that uh, nation and nation, uh, uh, that uh, nationality and nation states uh, emerge in 19th century Europe mostly uh, representative in nature, uh, mostly liberal in character uh, and they had to actually uh, fight a long war against the uh, conservative traditionalism represented by the monarchy and so forth and over a period of time it emerged triumphant and at the same time by the uh, time we reach the middle of 19th century that, that critical mass of industrial workers had come into being, the ideas of Marx had also spread and uh, there was some kind of attraction provided to these ideas and therefore, socialist collectivism uh, emerged as yet another 
uh, option, yet, yet another alternative uh, through which the yearnings and uh, futuristic uh, uh, kind of uh, setup uh, that could be a solution to these transformations were thought of. And uh, therefore, what we are trying to say here that they all represent different forms of social organization. They represent, uh, they, they, they think of different kind, they visualize uh, future society very differently from each other, all these ideas that we just spoke of. They reflect differing and conflicting material forces and alternative ways of looking at world, not as a, a mirror image, but as a quest for discovering their separate identities as well. So, it, it is not merely uh, uh, the material forces uh, configuring in a particular way and generating response in a particular way, but it is also aspirational, it, it is also uh, about future, it is, it is also about their how, how uh, some communities or some set of people wanted to forge their identities in future. Therefore, socialism the term in general ways uh, denoted uh, currents of thought that were hostile to the theory and practice of bourgeois individualism. Bourgeois individualism we have already spoken of in terms of liberal uh, individualism and so forth in terms of entrepreneurship those who were uh, increasingly getting into uh, industrial investments and earning profit uh, in uh, Britain uh, initially uh, they, they went uh, along the lines of uh, Adam Smith uh, arguing for uh, free trade uh, doing away with monopolies uh, its reverberance we could see even in the 1830s, 1813s. Uh, uh, in India as well through uh, government acts uh, and uh, uh, which, which did away with the monopoly that East India Company was enjoying uh, so far as Indian trade is concerned and so forth. So, uh, overall socialism as a term is, uh, is uh, not in consonance with what uh, the liberal bourgeois individualism is thinking about. It, it is at odds, it, it is hostile to, to uh, bourgeois individualism ideas and in a strict sense it was relevant to ideas and movements that were compatible with outlook of the new intelligentsia and industrial working class. So, what are the social constituencies that uh, socialism is catering to? It is the new intelligentsia, people in universities, uh, the literati. Uh, they they uh, perhaps uh, took uh, fascination to socialist ideas in 19th century Europe and also of course, the industrial working class uh, over which uh, the, this, uh, this idea was uh, or uh, it, this idea spread uh, among them and uh, it, it uh, asked them to organize themselves uh, against the uh, owner uh, class or against the uh, against the uh, industrial class, industrial owner class. Now, uh, when we say socialism in very general terms, as we did uh, uh, in the in the last couple of points that we discussed, uh, that in a strict sense it meant something. In general ways, it meant something. It is against bourgeois. Uh, individualism at the same time we speak of new il intelligentsia and industrial working class as the new social constituency of socialism. But uh, socialism uh, has to be understood uh, as little more distinct and separate from all kinds of uh, uh, all kinds of uh, negation of the uh, changes that were happening. Uh, it, it, it does not include all kinds of negations uh, of the changes that were happening. Uh, so, uh, for example, there were agrarian romanticists who were also not happy with uh, the way industrialization was happening, the way uh, urbanization or the new cities were coming up, the filth in cities, the loss of uh, uh, they, they keep bemoaning uh, the, uh, the loss of morality and all kinds of ethics, cleanliness and so forth and that is something that we have spoken about in earlier lectures. So, socialism differed from agrarian romanticism uh, in the sense that uh, the agrarian romanticism actually repudiates modern world uh, while socialism does not. So, when we speak of socialism we are not saying it is anti-industry, we are uh, socialism is fine with uh, industrial uh, production, big industries and so forth. 
all it wants is uh, a different kind of uh, equitous distribution or redistribution of wealth. Uh, and it was uh, more uh, equitous uh, or it stood for more equitous uh, redistribution of wealth uh, the way it was happening in uh, liberal uh, uh, bourgeois democracies. Similarly, it was not uh, fascist elitism, uh, elitism either because fascist elitism uh, rejects uh, the very principle that all men are equal and socialism is uh, rather uh, pro equality. So, overall one can say uh, if we run through different nomenclatures uh, that were uh, in currency in 19th century Europe, we have communists, we have democratic socialists, we have anarchists, we have anarcho syndicalists. All these uh, nomenclatures and groups uh, can be understood in the big set of socialist movement because they share certain basic assumptions about the nature of man and society and this, uh, this uh, uh, sharing of basic assumption about man and uh, nature of uh, man and society about the nature of man and society uh, is traceable to the enlightenment movement uh, that uh, was very evident uh, in Europe in the 18th uh, and even in the early part of 19th centuries Europe. And uh, it, it, is, uh, it is emerging from there, it is emerging from some basic assumptions about nature of man and society that uh, during the enlightenment period that socialism also owes its uh, emergence to. In this sense therefore, socialism is not a party level, but the designation of a historically conditioned response to a particular challenge. So, it is, it, is, uh, it is as a result of the circumstances created uh, as a consequence of industrialization, the kind of uh, social strife that uh, emerged out of it. So, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, uh, or, or as a response to this, it is these historical conditions which uh, made uh, conditions uh, uh, such that this kind of an ideology emerged. In one sense therefore, socialism like democracy from which of course, it stems uh, is rooted in sentiments as ancient and permanent as human society itself. And what is that uh, uh, sentiment which is very ancient? It is that man in community and the need to cooperate argument. So, what is it that we are talking about? There are two ways of looking at uh, uh, the innate nature of man. Uh, one can look at man the way Adam Smith did as uh, basically uh, individualized calculating savage. Right? So, uh, whatever be the uh, visualization of happiness of man, it can only happen in very individualized sense. So, uh, Adam Smith would see uh, man being happy uh, in individual sense only. Uh, so, it, it, it is, uh, is self-serving kind of instinct that can bring happiness uh, to mankind and therefore, his, uh, his proposition of free market is, uh, is presented as the best possible uh, economic mechanism that can take care of the innate nature of mankind and what is that innate nature of mankind that he is an individualized calculating uh, savage. And all these uh, attributes, all these uh, basic uh, nature of, of mankind can well be taken care of under market situation and he can prosper right? and therefore, he can make uh, himself happy. So, that is one way of looking at it. Whereas, uh, if you look at socialism which is yet another response uh, uh, or modern response to the changes that we are talking about, there is also a simultaneous uh, visualization of man as man in community, as, as a man who always needs uh, cooperation of others. And it is only uh, in community sense. Uh, it is only by elicit, eliciting cooperation from others that man can become happy. And therefore, uh, the ultimate uh, arrangement under which man will be happy uh, will be 
say communes uh, that Karl Marx talks of or social uh, circumstances. So, social circumstances cannot be divorced from uh, man's happiness. In fact, uh, uh, he goes on to say that man is born social. So, if you are born social, you will seek happiness in social context only. So, it, it is uh, not as individualized as uh, is Adam Smith's uh, proposition or presupposition about mankind. Therefore, individualism is a comparatively recent faith, whereas uh, socialism uh, in, 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 in its uh, philosophical sense, in its visualization sense is rather ancient, rather old. And uh, both uh, ob obviously are an outgrowth of certain kind of uh, social organization that comes into being uh, in response to uh, the changes that we are talking about. On your slide, you can see Adam Smith, uh, Adam Smith's ideas, the fantasy of calculating savage, something that we uh, just now spoke about, which is like uh, innate man is born with innate propensity to truck, barter and exchange. Uh, and this of course, this idea was born in the minds of 18th century writers who had recently discovered the charms of the market economy. And in this sense, uh, it can be also regarded as a worthy forerunner of Bentham's economic man and the philosophy of utilitarianism. So, it, it is this self-serving thing because you are beginning with uh, this assumption about mankind. So, it, it is the presupposition with which you begin your uh, visualization and ultimately you suggest ways uh, and means and structures or free market which can take care of those innate uh, propensities with which uh, man is born. So, uh, trucking with uh, others, bartering with others, uh, coming into agreement with others, coming into contact with others uh, with the intent to maximize your uh, gains and minimize your pains which is, uh, utilit which is what utilit utilitarianism is all about. Uh, greater good of greater masses and so forth. So, these are, uh, these are the postulations uh, uh, spoken about in, in, in one set. Uh, however, it is naive to, to suppose that uh, men had always lived in an environment that clearly distinguished economic relationships from family, social, tribal and political ties. In reality, this was not so. And this could happen only uh, or, or uh, uh, till exchange economy uh, arose and be became mainstream, uh, till that point of time uh, there was no clear cut distinction between uh, economic relationship, uh, family, social relationship, tribal and political relationships. So, economic activities or economic relationship was subservient to bigger social relationship within which life transacted. This is the point that we are making here. Uh, and uh, this kind of uh, uh, ideas that Adam Smith is talking about is actually, uh, uh, is actually a new uh, kind of development and it happened only when exchange economy arose and this uh, happened very late. This happened not before uh, the 18th century. So, uh, this is what uh, we have to understand and uh, in the next part of the lecture, we shall take this discussion uh, forward. Thank you.